Welcome once again to the Future Questions Show. Yes, I'm back. I'm talking to you, answering all of your questions about the future and raising a few of my own. Um, I've not been here for a while. I've been working, as most of you know, on my lovely uh, 3D printing book, which will look a little bit like that. Hopefully, that's the, hopefully the final cover now. And the manuscript, it's, it's almost there. Look, here it is. This is the manuscript for, for book number nine. Um, they're not as thick as they used to be because they're, they're double-sided, but hopefully this is all finished. There's even lovely pictures in it in, in places. Uh, this should now be out. Uh, hopefully in May and I'll, I'll be free of it, which means I've got more time to make videos um, with you. Right, um, the first thing I'll talk about is cryonics. Several of you raised uh, questions about um, cryonics or comments. Um, Warmax said, is cryonics still practiced today? If so, where and what prices? Well, look at somewhere like the Alcor Life Extension Foundation and you'll see that very much it is still practiced. Lerox22 went on to say, would cryogenics, cryonics affect long-term space travel? Um, we've seen it in all of the movies, people get chronically suspended uh, for their journey to a long uh, way away. I'm sure that sort of thing will happen if we ever do go off into space as human beings. Although, as I will explain in a very special video later this year, I don't think it'll be human beings quite in our current form who will, who will leave the Earth to colonize the stars. Having said all this, final comment I, I loved on, on cryonics was from Ron Nadal, who said, I will never try cryonics unless they manage to wake someone. Um, I have great sympathy with that view. Um, I suppose that the logic of the, the cryonics movement is you get yourself suspended on death, either your whole body or part of your body or your brain, frozen with liquid nitrogen. And then the future, they'll develop technology which will be able to work out what killed you, mend it, um, and also mend the damage caused by the freezing process. Now, that is a technical possibility, I suppose, as nanotechnology develops. But what it doesn't question is, why will people in the future, when we've developed all this new technology, go, right, just develop new technology, what's it for? Uh, is it for mending people today, for curing disease, for saving the planet? Or is it to go and find these rooms full of these frozen dead people and, and, and to wake them up again. You know, who are these people? And he, you know, why, why did they get frozen? Or just because you thought you might have nothing better to do than to wake them up and, 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 and to mend them. Um, for me, there's a slight flaw in that logic. Um, there must be a great sitcom based on that premise, people who go around waking up people from cryonic suspension, but maybe not. Anyway, last time I raised uh, with you a big question, which was, what is the most exciting or frightening future technology? Now, several of you gave me answers to that. Lots of you gave me answers to that. I've got a whole host of notes here just trying to figure out what you've all said and how I fit it all, all together. So apologies, I can't cover what everybody said. Um, and one of the things I was surprised about, that far more people focused on frightening technology than exciting technology, which, you know, I wasn't a bit surprised that actually happened. Um, Probably the thing most people talked about was the general principle of brain interfaces, um, uploading ourselves into a computer, thought control computing. Um, these three comments here sh show that. Um, Digital Sailor 9 said he talked about um, the fact we'll be able to transfer our consciousness into another body, organic or robotic. Um, also went on to say it'd be great to plug themselves into a games console. Um, Puppet 55 talked about mind reading or, or mind control. Fuyu Tenshi said the most frightening future tech would be attempts at life extension in involving uploading. And moving things on to the very practical, Zia Warriors pointed out that Interaxon will be releasing a thought control computing device very soon. And indeed that device has now been, been launched. You can go online and see the Muse, which is an EEG device for reading your brainwaves and controlling your computer, and similar to devices like the NeuroSky, uh, which has been on the market a while, or indeed the X-Wave, which allows you to have limited thought control of an iPhone or Android device. Now, for me, the interesting thing about um, potential developments in, in brain interfaces, in the brain computer interfaces, is they don't just allow potentially people to control computers and for people to upload themselves online into a robot body, people to visit virtual reality in a much more immersive way. The thing that's really fascinating to me and, and also frightening is if you can link a person to a computer, you can link a person to a computer and a computer back to another person. So effectively a brain-computer interface becomes a um, 
human human interface, a brain brain interface. And it isn't necessarily about just linking one brain to another brain via a computer. It could be linking lots and lots of brains to each other via, via computer technology. We've already got crowdsourcing as, as a major development, people sharing information, ideas, developing ideas online. Imagine what could happen if lots and lots of people could link to each other directly. We could literally read each other's thoughts, write each other's thoughts, share thoughts in a way beyond, beyond human intelligence. It's a, a, an incredible thought about the way evolution could go on this planet. Now, that also leads me on to what I thought was an amazingly interesting comment from Ariadne's fantasy, if I've got that right, who said the future will be frightening if we do not create technology that will help people understand other people. And I think that that is so true. Still one of our big problems is getting people to, 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 to share views and to not to, to fight wars and to waste so many resources on, on that type of thing. And that gets me to um, something else that many of you talked about, which was artificial intelligence. As you can see, for example, in the comments here, uh, Ian Polar CP, McLean 33, Kanazu Sun 2, um, all talked about the most terrifying technology being potentially artificial intelligence. And you can see that. We, we can think back to the science fiction films of the 1950s, 60s, 70s onwards, uh, where people worried about artificial intelligence taking over the world in some way. However, I think artificial intelligence has got a lot of very positive things um, potentially to offer us, not least linking people to people, language translation, in other words, will start to happen. You think what's happened in the past 20 years or so, a lot of barriers between people have fallen barriers of geography, barriers of time, um, because we can communicate electronically across the internet. But we are still separated by barriers of language, because we can't, even you can send a message to somebody else, if they speak a different language, they can't understand what you're, you're trying to imply. And I think that's one of the really big opportunities for artificial intelligence. It will allow people to communicate without the barrier of language getting in the way. We've already got things like Google Translate uh, online. Is it brilliant? People say no. Actually, I think it's amazing how, how good it's getting. You can read a web page in another language and make sense of it reasonably well already. Things like Google Conversation Mode will be starting to do that on, on, on phones fairly soon. So literally, you can speak in one language on your phone and you'll hear it as in, in another language with a bit of delay for translation at the other end. So, I think artificial intelligence actually is, is a very exciting technology because it will remove the last barrier between human beings. Okay, moving on. Um, also on the frightening side, many of you raise nanotechnology. Some of you raise nanotechnology on the positive side, enabling abundance. Of course, I, I would agree with that. Um, but it does clearly have potentially negative Im implications. Vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, MAD, have pointed out it could lead to terrorists getting hold of very, very sophisticated weapons, as does Duran D2 talked about the same thing. Um, and sticking with weapons, Sikotsky Oporunku, I'm sure I've got that wrong, but I'm trying, um, talked about the fact that the most frightening um, future technology uh, will be ethnic bioweapons, the idea of creating weapons which will only target certain people, certain ethnic groups. Um, that really is a, a frightening thought. But as we get more and more sophisticated in terms of genetic engineering, the development of pharmacogenetics, the development of, in other words, drugs which are targeted to certain genetic profiles, um, it could become possible to release a weapon which would literally kill off certain races, which is a horrific thought. I think the most frightening thought anyone raised in all, all the answers to that question about frightening or exciting technology. That is so frightening, I think we need to probably leave it there. Um, Vanguard Zen said, what's the limitations to my question? Could he go into science fiction or could she go into science fiction? Um, and asked if so, teleportation would be the most exciting. Well, of course, that will never happen. Sorry, I had to do that. It just seemed too good an opportunity to miss. Um, and as, as Jeremy Smith said, science fiction is only fiction because we haven't got it yet. So many of the things we, we take um, for granted today, mobile phones, internet access, even things like video um, communication, was for science fiction for years. And it, science fiction is still an incredible inspiration um, 
for people creating the latest technology. You know, things like cyberspace, as a word, came out of William Gibson's um, science fiction novels back in, what, 1986, and then became a word people used to talk about um, going online, going to virtual space after that. Science fiction and future studies and technology are very closely linked together. What else? Um, futurism. Quite a few people ask me about being a futurist. Um, Alt Tab said he was really interested in the field of, of futurism. Um, Zia Warriors again said, are there any tips I could give to people who are interested in getting into future studies? Well, if you're looking to study at a postgraduate level, there is the Singularity University of the United States, fairly specialist, but amazing work being done there. Far more accessibly, you have magazines like the Futurist, which comes out, uh, I think, six times a year. This is, what, $5.95. And there's a, there's a great website for the World Futures Society and various subscriptions at both student level and, and non-student level. I can't get a student subscription because, sadly, I'm slightly too old for that. Having said that, future studies is something I think you get into via something else. Um, I know quite a few futurists, and I know of a, a lot more. And all of them, all of us, tended to start out doing one thing related to technology normally, and that got, got us in, into the area. Um, in my case, the way it worked out is that I very much was into computing. I was employed in a university to actually start teaching um, organisational theory. And they said, would you do a bit of computing? I said, all right, then. And it became quite a lot more computing. And back in 1994, I wrote this book, Cyber Business Mindsets for a Wide Age, um, which became the first e-business book to be published in the UK. And after I'd published that, people started describing me as a futurist. It wasn't a title I went after. And I think most people get into future studies by doing that. They create a technology, they write about something, they get known in a particular area, and people start referring to them as a futurist. I think anyone who starts to refer to themselves as a futurist before they started doing it is probably on a, on a hiding to nothing because the biggest problem um, working in the area is people going, isn't that rubbish? Um, can I have let's week's lottery numbers, please? Um, you have to have done something to build yourself a bit of stature. So if you're getting into the area, be interested in everything. Follow technology forward. Read things you know, like, like the futurist, like explaining the future dot com. But I would say develop a particular thing you're interested in and then build from that um, in the future. What else have we got? A few quick fires here. Uh, the Darth Loki um, said the most interesting technology could be aquaponics. Well, I think that's very true. Um, and I'm going to tell you all about aquaponics in July. I don't normally know exactly what I'm going to tell you about something, but the reason I do know is that a couple of days ago, I have arranged to visit and, and shoot a video at a new aquaponic farm which is being built um, in London, probably as we speak. They're just putting a particular piece into place. So in July, I'll report back on aquaponics. If you don't know what it is, very, very exciting and, and you'll see it um, in reality. What else have we got? Um, Ian Polar CP said, if we don't deal with, with climate change, then we're going to get many island countries are, go are going to be flooded. And therefore, we're going to get what could be potentially extinct states. We're going to get states where um, the country's got no land, uh, but they could still be recognised as a country. How will that work? Will we have virtual countries because they have internet presence, Swiss bank accounts, but no land to, to, to back them up? That, that really is a, a fascinating thought. I don't know what the answer is to that, but um, I can see where you're coming from. It, it raises all sorts of issues, doesn't it? The landless state. Um, maybe they'll build artificial islands that will survive the flooding. I, I don't know. Um, finally, I've got to Tony Beer. Always got to get to Tony Beer. Tony said, in relation to the question of the most frightening and exciting technology, has to be the singularity. And I think Tony has to be right there. Um, and it's such a big issue that I thought I'd make that the subject of the question for the next future question show. So the question for next time is, are we approaching the singularity? If you don't know what the singularity is, of course, what you need to do is to watch this video I made all about singularity or decline last year. Marvellous video. Very few people watching it. Never mind. Um, but there we are. So 
we've gone through loads and loads of things. Thanks for all of your, your questions and your, your, your comments. Um, please um, ask questions and, and raise comments again, and we'll do this again sooner than the gap between this video and the que future question show before it. But now that's it for another video, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.